Good morning. So much has been shared. I feel like uh, we've covered a whole lot, about 125 years of ministry and celebrated in many ways. And uh, guys, for that song, that just fits perfectly with what I want to share this morning. But first of all, I want to say it's, it's an honor to come back. It's really a privilege. I would have never expected to receive this invitation. And um, it's, it, it's really just a blessing to be here and to share with you all the words that Sheldon shared and Jane and Matt and Emmy are really true. It's, uh, this is a unique congregation and uh, <clears throat> Nancy and I were so blessed last night by the concert. Not just the music, the participants, those who organized it, it was wonderful. But one of the special blessings that's a hallmark of this church is the children and youth that shared in that concert. You see, that's what building up and strengthening the church is all about. It's taking risks, as you did with Sheldon as a young pastor, welcoming a young superintendent as I was back in the day, listening, encouraging, and blessing. One of the things I said to Nancy as we were driving up here yesterday from Omaha was, this church knows how to do music. And that's one of the many things that you do well. Now, I'll pat you on the back some, but I'll warn you, I'm also going to challenge you. And that, that's part of what I think God calls us to in Scripture. It's wonderful to make connections with so many of you. It's uh, hard to admit and reflect that uh, our relationships with all of you who have been leadership in some capacity and sat in on meetings that I've been a part of, it all started over 30 years ago. That's a long time. But it, it, it creates a kinship, not just with people, but through the Lord and through shared ministry and ministry partnership. So thank you for the opportunity to share this morning. Join with me in prayer, will you? Lord God, we thank you for the uh, joy to be together, for the joy and the opportunity to serve you, for the joy it is to worship in community and to sense your spirit and your presence here flowing out of the people that love you and have served you and remembering those who have gone before and established this church 125 years ago. So may the, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable and honoring to you. Amen. I'm glad I've got a glass of water here. I'll explain that a little more because <clears throat> less than two weeks ago I was in bed with acute bronchitis, praying hard that I was even going to be able to be here today. So uh, the water will be my friend, and hopefully we'll do just fine. <clears throat> Back in 2006, the chief of the National Park Services of the Historic Landmark Survey, now that's a long title, but it has to do with the fact that they developed a unique program, a program called the Witness Tree Protection Program. It was designed to protect landmark trees, primarily in Washington, D.C., but then it has been expanded to include more trees all around our country. These trees stand as a living testament to significant moments in our nation's history. They include trees that are located in some pretty tragic places, battlefields like Manassas, Antietam, Gettysburg. From recent history, there's almost, there's another one. And that's an almost 100-year-old elm tree that sits in the heart of Oklahoma City that survived the horrific blast when the Murrah Federal Building was exploded and many, many lives were lost. 
There's another tree that stands on the banks of the Mississippi, right near a cave where young Samuel Clemens played a lot as a kid. That tree became very prominent in, in his writings when he took the name Mark Twain and wrote the book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. That tree dates back to the 1700s. There's, there's more I could say, but I'll just end it with one more example. And that's a forest of trees. They're called pine crest cone trees. They're in a national forest in my home state of California, the southern part of the Sierra Nevadas. These trees are believed to date back 5,000 years. They may be the oldest trees on the planet. <clears throat> I suspect with all the trees around this church building and in this immediate neighborhood, that they stand as living witnesses to the faithfulness. They may date back all the way to when the church was first, the first building was put on this property in 1898, as you saw on the, the screen just a few moments ago. They are living witnesses to the faithful ministry of this congregation, the gatherings for worship each week, for Sunday school, for the youth groups that gathered, for women's ministries and men's ministries, for weddings, for previous anniversary celebrations, for the joys of holiday festivities. I remember reading through the Centennial book and seeing how this sanctuary was decorated at Christmas time. Boy, people went all out. And then there are the community events you've shared together over these many decades. And of course, there have been funerals of church family and community members as well. These trees around here have seen it all. Some of these trees have witnessed the expansion of this building, the expansion that speaks to the vitality and faith <clears throat> of this congregation going back well over 100 years. The trees around here are deeply rooted. They've survived fierce storms, not just ice storms, Matt, but I know tornadoes, snowstorms. I remember one ice storm that we had in Omaha that split trees in half because there was so much ice and the leaves were still on the trees. I know of the severe weather that can happen, major diseases that can hit trees, and yet they're here. Now, there's another type of witness to the life of this congregation. The living presence of each one of us gathered here you see, we all have a meaningful connection to this church. We may not go back 125 years, but I bet some of you can go back to a large portion of the history of this church or have heard stories from your grandparents or your great-grandparents about the ministry of this church and God's faithfulness over a long, long period of time. So we've heard stories of the past, and recently, stories have been shared by the students and adults who attended Chick. People that you supported to send them to this wonderful event back in July. Now I'd like to consider how we continue to be witnesses with the surrounding trees as well to the creation of more ministry moments, more memories that will be created in the future celebrating many years yet to come in the life of this church. And so we have our text. If you have Bibles, feel free to turn to Colossians 2, 6 and 7. It's short verses, but there's a lot that Paul has to say to the Colossian church and to us about what it means to be strongly rooted witnesses for Jesus Christ. You see, in the Colossi church, which Paul is writing to, there were fierce winds and storms created by false teachers and many temptations that were blowing in the culture at that time, <clears throat> causing the people to drift and sway in their faith and in their lifestyles, in the choices they made of how they spent their life each day. 
Bottom line is the church was struggling. No, it really isn't any different from what many churches face today. All of us can be susceptible to listening to and being influenced by false messages because they're everywhere. Just think about it. All you have to do is turn on your computer, go to blog sites, go to the internet, go to social media, TV, we even can even get the newspaper now on, on your computer, along with magazines and books. There are many messages coming through technology today that claim to be based on Scripture, and they're just not. Paul is telling the Colossians and us, as we read this text, that there are three things that can help us continue to be deeply rooted as witnesses for Christ. Not wavering with outside influences, but deeply rooted in Christ. Things that have actually contributed to the fact that this church is healthy and vibrant after 125 years. So the first one is, <clears throat> looking at verse 6. So then you have received Christ, continue to live in him. Rooted, and I'm going to stop there. Live in him. Living into the message that he has given us in his word. In John 1.1 1, 1 it says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. Then you go to verse 2, and it reminds us that Jesus was with God from the beginning. So therefore, to be deeply rooted in the word is to be deeply rooted in Christ. And Christ being rooted in the scriptures and in our hearts is what gives us the foundation of a strongly rooted faith. You see, the Bible was inspired by God, and it wasn't written just to give us knowledge, but to help all readers to grow in wisdom and how we share our lives how we live our lives, how we make choices. You know, it's not simply good enough to be smarter believers, but to share and live more like Jesus is what he wants. In other words, smarts are okay, but how we choose to live our lives, because people need the Lord, and we're the messengers. So what does it mean to be deeply rooted? It means becoming more like Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus. Now to help you understand this a little bit, I'm gonna paint a picture. We lived in Omaha for 26 years. Drove by the old house a couple times since we arrived on late Wednesday night. But years ago, we were given the gift of a rose bush and we thought, oh, this is great. We'll put it down by the sidewalk in our front yard, and that'll be a great place for us to enjoy it and the neighbors as well. Well, the first few years, it grew wonderful and beautiful white blossoms. And then we began to notice a change. There were white blossoms, but there were also red blossoms. The white blossoms had become transformed. You see, we realized that what was happening was the neighbor's red rose bush about 10 feet away had roots that were mingling with our rose bush. And in just a few years, our bush became all red. The white was gone. Now, before I get into the symbolism of colors, we'll leave it at that but to share with you that being deeply rooted in God's Word brings transformation. It brings change. As we open our hearts and the roots of our very soul to God's transforming power, we become more like Jesus. Are our hearts open? 
Are they continually open to the transforming power that God can bring through his word? Matt talked about Awana, and uh, I'm excited about any kind of children's ministry that happens during the week at, at churches. You see, we can never start too early to root our children in the scriptures, in God's word. Having the children rooted early through Awanas gives them a stronger faith for the future. You see, because Awana has one big priority, I mean many, but one in particular, and that's scripture memorization. There are still verses that I remember from when I was a kid that are foundational and supportive to me as I live my life each day. I think with technology, and I'm going to sound like an old grandpa here, with technology and all that goes on today, kids are less prone to do any kind of memorization. And so I encourage you to continue to come alongside your kids and your grandkids. It doesn't have to just be Awana. We got a lot of grandparents out here that can be nurturing their children and grandchildren as well. You see, the other principle is, is, is just not just enough to know God, but to truly allow him to penetrate our being. And in verse 7, Paul is saying, strengthened in faith as you were taught, as you were taught. One of the principles that Nancy and I have tried to live by is that we're lifelong learners. You see, we're never too old nor too young to be learning, embracing, rooting ourselves in the Word of God. The very roots of our lives, that's the foundation that holds us together when things are tough. So many of the words of the songs that were sung last night and even today help us understand that there, life can be tough, but when we're rooted in God's Word, and in that relationship with him, it helps carry us through those tough times. Rooted in God's word, the first point. The second one, we also need to be deeply rooted in our commitment to Jesus and his call to serve. That's what strengthening and building up the church is all about that he refers to in verse 6. We are called not to keep our faith in a cocoon, but to share it. To share it and to live it. As we choose to live our faith, we strengthen our own faith and then we build up others. Now, it's interesting to see the setting. Paul is writing from prison. <clears throat> and he's sitting in Rome, writing back to the people in Colossae. And he reminds his readers that life, in fact, isn't about us. He's saying, live in him. There's nothing about living for me. But rather, it's living for Christ. As we live for him, we are more likely to become contagious and be willing to mingle the roots of our lives with the roots of others and thereby continuing to build up the kingdom of God. Coming alongside people in the church and people outside, not only this building, but outside this community of faith. You see, we live in a world every day that's not in these pews. How do we impact life at home, life at school, life at work, Life in our neighborhoods. Now, I realize some of your neighborhoods are a little different than the ones we live in in the city. You don't have neighbors right next door, but you still interact with people in your community every day. Being rooted, strong witnesses in our community is what God calls us to do. Now, however, our environment, the world we live in, again, as has been spoken already this morning, presents obstacles to our rooted faith. Just think about it. They creep into the soil of our lives. 
We're going to put some labels on them this morning. Things like materialism. What's new? What do we have in our garage? Or what do we have in our house? Or what do we need to have? Entitlement. What's best for me? Selfishness. Pride. Control. And as we get older, one that becomes very tempting is financial security. All the messages, I don't know how we get on all these different mailing lists, but all the messages we get in the junk mail is, do you have enough money to survive in your retirement? You know, all of those obstacles are things that Colossi, the people of Colossae faced as well. Now, they probably didn't use the same labels or the same terms, but it impacted them, and that's why Paul's writing these words. You see, my brothers and sisters, these obstacles can seep into our lives and we don't even realize it. They can become co-mingled with our roots of faith in ways that bring about unhealthy fruit and reduce our harvest of souls for the kingdom. Therefore, we need to ask a couple of questions. How will God shape and mold us to make a difference for him in our world today? Here in Wausau, in Knox County, and beyond. How do we continue to be living, committed witnesses? My youngest brother was a senior pastor in Michigan in Ohio for almost 30 years until he had to go on disability because of health issues. He had a statement he'd like to use. It fits with our thoughts about being deeply rooted and committed in Christ to serve others. He said, or he said, he puts it this way, the commitments we make are the commitments that make us. Let me repeat that. The commitments we make are the commitments that make us. Now, this is where it gets a little personal. One way to potentially live out this call to serve may involve you who are present church leaders in any capacity, no matter what it is. Are you seeking out and nurturing potential new leaders People that haven't yet served, but have that potential. Are you seeking to come alongside them in discipleship training, in mentoring, in listening to them, realizing they may have a different approach to ministry than you've been used to hearing? Make sure that there's an environment where they can share their thoughts and not be judged. Who are the next generation of leaders, teachers, youth leaders, workers in the kitchen, people who will keep up the, the building? This is what strengthening and building our faith into others is all about. The commitments we make are the commitments that make us. Another aspect of serving Paul is challenging the Colossians to look to the future. As deeply rooted believers, we need to think about how to share our love, our resources. You may have heard the terms our time, our talent, our treasure with those in need. Those who are hurting, those who are poor, those who are hungry, Lonely, unemployed, underemployed, victims of injustice. There are plenty of people around Wassa and Knox County who have these kinds of needs. How are we coming alongside them? How are we encouraging them, loving them, even allowing the roots of our faith to mingle with their lives in a way that they can become rooted in Christ. The challenge is there, and it always is there. 
So recognizing our need to be rooted in God's word is one point. Recognizing our need to be rooted in faith so that we, in our commitment to serve Christ, can serve and love others. And finally, we need to be rooted, as Paul says in the very last part, with overflowing thankfulness. We need to be rooted in our gratitude. For all Christ has done for us, the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ, in his death, in his life, of course, in the message he gave, and in his resurrection. How can we do any less in expressing our gratitude to God than to serve him? Well, I got news for you. It's probably not news for you at all. It's not always easy to say thank you. It's easy to worry about what's going to happen in our lives next week or next month. But I remember an old song that uh, some of the, the songs that have been sung this weekend made me think of it. It's from back when I was young and Andre Crouch was the songwriter and he said, how can I give thanks for all the things that you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave your life for me. That's gratitude. And that's what God calls us to, the spirit of it. Not out of guilt, not out of a burden, but rather because he loves us and we need to share that love. Now, part of the anniversary celebration is remembering all that God has done for this congregation. We've heard a lot of that and we'll hear probably more this afternoon. But think of the vision and faithfulness, the sacrifices that the founders of this church made that we can be grateful for. And now we're called to carry on the mission for the faithful and gifted and dedicated pastors and spouses who have served. And it's great to have Sheldon and Jane and Matt and Emmy to hear other uh, words from other pastors They gave their lives and service here. But then there have been all of you, committed lay people, who have taught Sunday school faithfully, who have worked with children and been youth leaders, who have helped nurture the music program of this church, for those who have prepared hundreds and thousands of meals in that kitchen downstairs, and those who have helped keep the the, the church building bright and nice inside and out. We can give thanks too for those who had the vision and passion to support camping ministry. When I first walked on the grounds of Covenant Cedars, I thought, what's the deal here? I see what are now pretty old cabins and some of them have gone on to be replaced by new cabins, but I saw the names of churches and I realized, oh, the Wassa cabin was built by this church and the people of this church. The same with the Omaha cabin and the Mead cabin, and so it goes. You have generously given and supported the ministry of camping since Covenant Cedars started over 60 years ago. So we give thanks for the many people who have been sent out as well as pastors, as missionaries, as lay leaders to serve in other communities and other congregations always prayed for and supported by this church family and never forgotten. The fruit of gratitude is evident in many ways, but I want to just point out one. I tried to do some homework from the wonderful information that uh, Betty Olson and Betty ba- uh, Kathy Olson and Betty Banks sent me, and I was reading about the Every Kid a Camper program. I think that started, Sheldon, when you were here. Well, let me give you an update. And I'm not sure exactly what these numbers represent or what period of time, but at least the last 25 years. I stand in amazement as I think of how generously you supported 1,623 kids going to camp. Did you know that? Well, we praise God for that. Just do a little mathematics. 25 into 1,623, that's an average of 65 campers a year. 
from this church. Now, I know they didn't all come from this congregation, but that, again, is a part of your gratitude and generosity to support and make sure that God's transforming love has been rooted in the lives of these kids through camping ministry. Not just planted, but rooted in many of their lives. And uh, yet, some of them are right here this morning. Some of them are you. I know camping ministry was vital in my life. And you see, that makes a statement to the community and the county. In a world that says, it's all about me, you're saying, no, it isn't. It's about you. It's about others. It's about the community. It's about coming alongside people. Now I'd like to leave one more challenge with you before I close. And I'm going to put the kids who went to Chick on the spot. Some of you are probably here. And I don't mean to embarrass you, but here's what I want to say. Having been to quite a number of Chicks over the years, I read in the newsletter that you sent 11 students. And now they've returned home from this wonderful event with different interests, different passions, different levels of faith. But you are deeply rooted believers, many of you, in this congregation. And I encourage you to come alongside these students. Find ways to have conversations with them. Find ways to listen to their passions, their interests, what they might want to pursue in the way of ministry. Create safe places where they can talk about whatever it is that may be on their hearts. Again, it may be out of the box. It may not be traditional. But it's what God is placing in their lives and hearts. It may even be talking to them about a possible call to ministry for these young men and these young women. Encourage them. Bless them. Intentionally come alongside and be willing to listen. It may be awkward at first for them and for you. But you know what? God wants us to build up the church. And when when students come home from an experience like this, it's easy to just let it slide. I encourage you to help them express their gratitude to God for what he's done for them and how they can find a niche in ministry in this community and in this church because he calls us all to serve, not just the old folks. That's me. That's why I can say old folks. You see, we are called to continually offer gratitude. Paul is saying overwhelming or overflowing with thankfulness. That's not just a little gush here and there. God wants us to be grateful all the time, just as we are this weekend gathered to say thank you for 125 years. But now as we look forward with anticipation of what God is going to do through the witnesses, the living, rooted witnesses of this congregation. May you maintain your rootedness, first of all, in his word. Secondly, by serving in rooted faith, strengthened faith, to build up one another and come alongside those who have yet to come to faith. And finally, do it in a spirit of gratitude. As we celebrate these wonderful years of ministry, I'm reminded of what a rural pastor had to say in the recent issue of the Cub magazine. Now that's, for those of you who've been around a while, it used to be called the Covenant Companion. Now it's called the Cove. This is what this pastor had to say. We need to remember we don't exist for the church of yesterday. We exist for the church of now and what the church will be in the future. We don't exist for the church of yesterday, but for the church of now and the church in the future. May God bless you as you envision and pursue what he wants you to do through this congregation tomorrow, next week, and in the next 25 years and thereby creating more ministry memories 
for the living witnesses that are all around you in the trees. May God bless you as you serve him and honor him and bless him in the future. Amen.